All right, thank you all so much for joining us to discover the unknown world of beavers with the Mass Audubon. Few animals can change entire landscapes like beavers can. The American beaver is an incredible wetland engineer and can be found throughout Massachusetts transforming their habitats. This online presentation will cover beaver family life, range, lodge, and dam maintenance, and how they contribute to the biodiversity of open spaces. And this program is led by Scott Santino, who's the education manager and teacher naturalist at the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield, where he has been leading nature education programs for Mass Audubon since 1999. You don't look that old, Scott. Uh, so uh, we want, yeah, we want to uh, thank the uh, friends of the Tewksbury Library again for sponsoring. And so for all uh, 75 plus of us who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Scott for joining us today. And Scott, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Great, thank you very much, Robert, and welcome everyone. I'm thrilled that you're taking an hour out of your day to join me to learn about one of my favorite mammals, the American beaver. Just think of all the other things you could be doing right now. You could be folding laundry, you could be washing dishes, but for you to be able to sit down and spend about 60 minutes with me today to learn about this amazing animal really means a lot. And so thank you for joining me. What I'd like to start with is how it began, this interest in beaver uh, for me. I, as Robert mentioned, I started at Mass Audubon in 1999, and not too after, long after I started as a naturalist there, uh, we had someone come to our visitor center at the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield and let us know that there was a beaver caught in one of our cages. And, and so we kind of scratched our heads a little bit, but the office manager and I jumped in the property truck and drove down to one of our wetlands. And there was a structure like the one you're seeing now called a beaver deceiver, which we'll talk more about. And sure enough, in the gauge of the fencing, a beaver had wedged itself in and was stuck. And you could tell it was exhausted. It had, must have been trying for hours to try to get itself out of the fencing. So my office manager and I tag team this where she grabbed the clippers and went around the front of the beaver deceiver and I went around to the back of the beaver deceiver to try to distract the animal so that way we could cut some of the links out and let the animal free so we cut out from around it and there the beaver still laid and so again it must have been exhausted and so I gently kind of tapped it on the back of it and it lifted its big flat tail slapped it in the mud covered me in mud and then bloop made its way down into the pond. And what, what a transformative moment that was for me as a young naturalist. It really made me wonder more about this incredible animal that I had had such a, a close experience with. The way that we'll navigate today's presentation is we'll go through these four main bullet points. We'll talk a little bit about beaver classification. What is this incredible animal? We'll give a historic overview of this animal. It has a very unique cultural history here in the United States. Then we'll get into the animal's natural history, all about them. How do they live? Where do they live? What do they eat? How many babies do they have? Fun stuff like that. And then we'll wrap up this afternoon's presentation with some beaver conservation. I find that a lot of people are interested in beavers not so much because they're interested in this cool mammal, but because perhaps in your communities, this is an animal of great controversy. Maybe this is an animal that's creating some troubles in your town, especially in a summer when we've been having lots of rain. All right, so what exactly is a beaver? Well, let's start with what taxonomy is. Every living organism that people have discovered on earth, we've tried to put into a category so that way we can better understand it. And so the beaver has a number of different classifications depending upon what level of an animal you're talking about it. For those of you that enjoyed biology class back in high school or maybe even college, you may remember this list of classifications. For me, I like to use something called mnemonic devices. They are tricks that you can use to help retention, retain and or retrieve information. For me, I used King, Philip, crossed over four, great, spaghetti. And perhaps you had one that was similar that you remember 
way back from being a student in high school or college. And of course, that mnemonic device helps one remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. All of the known living organisms that people have discovered put them into each of these categories to help us gain a better understanding about the animal. And so when we talk about the American beaver, these are all their classifications. And you may notice, even though this is in Latin, these are terms that you might regularly use when describing animals that you come across in nature. So for example, it's in the kingdom Animalia. So beavers are an animal. It's in the phylum Chordata. The subphylum within Chordata is something called vertebrata. So beavers belong to one of the five groups of animals that have backbones or are vertebrates. They are in the class Mammalia. And that might be a term that we use most regularly. Oh, I know that animal. It's a, it's a mammal, right? It's in the order Rodentia or rodents. So beaver are related to things like mice and squirrels. They have characteristics that are very similar to those smaller mammals. And we'll get into those characteristics more deeply as we move along. It's in the family Castoridae. This American beaver is the only family member of its kind within the United States. You would have to go to other areas of the world in order to find like family members. And it's in the genus Castor. That's its, its, its group name. There are a couple of other beavers that you can find throughout the world. This is the only beaver that we have in North America and its species is Canadensis. And so that's a quick overview of how beavers are categorized scientifically. But what are their characteristics? What makes a beaver a beaver? It's great to know all of that Latin, that scientific terminology, right? But when we're looking and we're studying this animal, what are some of the things that make it a beaver? Or in some instances, a mammal or a rodent, et cetera. So of course, it has the presence of hera fur covering its body that helps to protect it. It helps to keep it warm. It helps to keep it dry. It also helps to protect it from harmful UV light from sun and things like that. On hot days, like we've been experiencing over the last couple of weeks with this heat and humidity, beaver have and mammals have sweat glands to help cool and reduce the heat of the body. If you were a miss beaver, you would have mammary glands, which of course produce milk to help feed young. Beaver also have specialized teeth, as do all mammals. When you talk about mammal taxonomy and you go through whether it's a rodent or a lagomorph or a canine or a feline, a lot of that taxonomy has to do with the teeth that are in the animal's skull. And then there are some characteristics that are internal. These are things that we can't see when we see a beaver swimming by in a pond, but this is what separates them from their reptilian-like ancestors. They have three middle ear bones. Um, their, their predecessors um, back in the Jurassic period would have had one solid ear bone. They also have a neocortex region of the brain. And this is important because it helps mammals to be able to become really specialized in habitats in which they are seeing and hearing. A lot of the mammals that we have present in New England and beyond, we don't see on a regular basis because they're primarily active at night. In order to be able to survive at night, they need to be able to see well, and they need to be able to hear well, and they need to be able to smell well. And so they're well suited for that. They have a four chambered heart, so that way they can pump all that oxygenated blood around. And of course, they're endothermic. That's a fancy name for saying that these are warm blooded creatures. In other words, the energy that they consume to help all of their biological functions also creates a body temperature for which keeps the animal going. There's also various types of mammalian reproduction. And we won't dive into this too deeply, but I do think it's worth going over quickly. And I'm gonna try to keep this today's lecture as interactive as possible. So I'm gonna ask you questions. You can say the answer out loud if you want, kind of like Jeopardy style, if you were watching Jeopardy on the couch, or you're welcome to put them in the chat as well. My question for you is this. There are three types of mammal reproduction. Do you know what they are? What are the terms that describe the three types of mammal reproduction? 
And I'll give you just a few moments to think about that and put that in the chat if you wish. Okay, here we go. These are the three groups. We have monotremes, we have marsupials, and we have placentals. And so the beaver, as is underlined and bolded, is a placental. This is believed to be uh, the more highly evolved type of reproduction in the mammal order. What are monotremes though, since I presented these three words? Monotremes are egg-laying mammals. They're what we call oviparous. And we only have a couple remaining on Earth, none of which are in the New World, South America or North America. They're in primarily Australia and New Zealand. And these are uh, things like the platypus that you may be familiar with. These are leg ang mammals, again, very closely related evolutionary to our reptiles, right? If you were to come across a turtle, they would be laying eggs on land like monotremes do. Then we have marsupials. Marsupials have taken the next step. These are animals that will give birth to live young, but the live young are really underdeveloped. And so what they do is they need to, after birth, crawl into a pouch on the mother's body. And within that pouch, they can continue to develop and continue to nurse. We have one marsupial that you can find in the United States. Do you know that marsupial? Perhaps you do. It's our Virginia opossum. And then finally, we have placentals. If you look in the mirror, you're looking at a placental. These are mammals that have a longer development within the female after fertilization. The placenta is a structure within the female and it passages oxygen and nutrients from the mother to the fetus. It also will pass carbon dioxide and waste from the fetus to the mother. We would call this type of live birth viviparous. And so that's what our modern mammals do. And that's what beavers do. They're placentals and give birth to live young. As I mentioned before earlier, a lot of mammal taxonomy is studied based on looking at teeth. And this is a, a view of a beaver skull from the top the bottom and the front. And you can see some wonderful adaptations here. If you were to smile in the mirror, your teeth would look much different than what we're seeing in this skull right now. Now, of course, the skull plays an important role. It houses a lot of the animal's sensory. The eyes, the ears, the nose, of course, the brain, and the teeth. And there are certain parts of this skull that have specialized names, which we'll talk a little bit about here. This area here that we're seeing, the eyes, we call that the orbit. And the orbit is simply the place that houses the, the eyes. It's the eye socket. We also have this area here that's long and narrow on the front of the animal skull. We call this the rostrum or the snout. This is where the olfactory sense of, of mammals is housed. When we flip the skull over, here in the back, we will see kind of these bulbous looking things. We call that the auditory bulla. These are bulbs that show us where the inner ear is housed. And when you look at a skull, you can get an idea of how well a mammal's sense of hearing is based on how round that auditory bulla is. And here on this beaver skull, we're seeing that you know, it, it's, it's pretty well rounded. So beaver have a good sense of hearing. As we take a look at the front of this skull, we're not gonna talk about the teeth just yet, but what I'd like to point out is as we look at the top of it, you'll notice how flat this animal's skull is. And if you were to kind of envision a live beaver floating at the top of the water's surface, and it has just the top of its head, up out of the water, poking up, you'd notice that the beaver can see above water, hear above water, and smell above water. All of these sensory places on the beaver's skull are on the top, which is an important part if you are an animal that is mostly aquatic, although they can spend time on land. When we look at the teeth, we see a number of types of teeth. 
we have incisors here in the front. Rodents have this gap here that other mammals don't have. This is called the diastema. And this is an area where a lot of rodents will hold nibbled food. If you've ever seen the groundhog in your garden or you know, a, another rodent scurrying away, they might have some plants in their teeth and it's being held in that spot be, behind the incisors. And then we have this area here that we call the premolars and then we have the molars in back. And you'll notice here in the beaver skull, the premolars and molars are very flat. This tells us a lot about this animal's life history. They are herbivores. They eat plant material. And then we have the orange incisors. Well, why uh, do they have orange incisors? So let's take another view of this skull. Here we have a beaver skull with its lower jaw or mandible. The mandible is the only movable part of a mammal skull. And of course, it goes up and down in order to process food. You'll notice that the orange is only on the front side of the incisors. That's because there is this mineral iron on the front. That mineral makes the front of the incisors stronger than the back. And so as this beaver chews, and they chew a lot, you'll see that it wears the teeth down into a chisel-like shape. This makes rodent teeth nice and sharp, and it would allow them to be able to gnaw. And if you are a beaver, you need to gnaw and chew down rather large trees. And so these teeth are extremely important for this animal's life history. So that's a quick overview of beavers and kind of what makes a beaver a beaver based on taxonomy and based on unique characteristics of mammals and rodents and of course, beaver falling under those categories. So we'll take a moment to pivot here. And what I'd like to do next is to talk a little bit about the historical overview. And, and uh, Robert, I'll just pause here for a moment and say, um, you know, I'm not looking actively at the chat I don't want that to distract me from the content that I'm delivering. So please feel free to jump in and, and pause if there's a, a timely question you'd like to ask me before we get too far removed from the content. Does that sound okay? Will do, Scott. Great. All right. So why would I have a slide that has a bunch of hats? Well, we're going to get into that, and perhaps you already know. But maybe what you didn't know is that here in Massachusetts, beavers were absent from the landscape for more than 150 years. We call that extirpation. It means that they're extinct from an original region. And of course, we know today that beavers are doing quite well here in New England. But it creates kind of a really interesting story. So back in the late well, I should say by mid-1600, once the European colonists came to the New World, they wanted to take advantage of the resources they had. And, and North America was rich in wildlife. And so if you were something with fur or feathers in the early to mid-1600s, chances are pretty good you were hunted and used for various reasons. It's estimated based on records that by mid-1600, approximately 80,000, yes, thousand, 80,000 beaver pelts were leaving the new world and going over to Europe, primarily Holland and England. And what did they do with these beaver pelts? They made hats, they made beaver hats. At about 1780, beaver hats were started to being made in the United States. There were a lot of them here in New England. And what they did with these beaver furs and pelts was they had to, you know, preserve them. They put something on them. And what they used at that time was a chemical called mercury nitrate, which of course we know now today as being a neurotoxin. And so the people who worked in these factories that treated the beaver pelts poisoned themselves, you know, through their work. And they started to have mental fogginess. They started to have uncontrollable twitching. And that behavior, that result from being poisoned, 
became known as the Danbury Shakes. And it's likely how the term was phrased, you're mad as a hatter, because people who were, were prepping and, and making these hats in, in the 1700s were not, it, it was not a very safe trade to be in. Other things beaver was, were used for, of course, were for their meat. Oft, a lot of um, both indigenous and Europeans would use beavers for food. And, and I came across this little notation, which I thought was really, really unique, that when French settlers made their way to the New World, you know, up in the French Canadian area of, of northern New England, Canada, they were allowed by the Pope to consume beavers during fasting times because of the scale-like tail that the beaver had, they decided to classify the beaver at that time as being a fish, which I thought that was kind of unique and interesting. The other picture here shows a gentleman who has shot a, uh, an egret. And of course, at the time that the beavers were being hunted, many of North America's birds were also being hunted for women's fashion. And that's how Mass Audubon came to be. You know, I, I have this wonderful job because of the founding mothers of Mass Audubon, Harriet Hemingway and Mina Hall, because they stepped up to stop the, the slaughter of, of wildlife, mainly birds. So let's take a look at the map. Um, the current beaver range shows the dark brown. I like this color because it shows kind of how they kind of reestablished their ranges. In the red area, that's kind of the primary. There were beavers that did okay in those areas. They weren't completely exterminated from that area. But through time, from 1700s into the 1800s and into present day, you can see the orange and then the yellow shows where beavers slowly but surely were able to reestablish their native range. They did not do this on their own. There was some help. And here in Massachusetts, for those of you that are tuning in from Massachusetts, you can find beaver in every county of Massachusetts, except for Dukes County, which is Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket County, which of course is Nantucket. Imagine that. It's its own island, it's its own town, and its own county. Nantucket is a pretty cool and unique place. So here today, because beavers are a common animal, they can still be hunted legally and under hopefully, you know, appropriate permitting. And so if you are a fur bearing trapper, you can trap beaver from November 1st to April 15th. And that allows us to be able to take this animal at a time in which they're not active raising young. To talk about how beavers reestablished our area here in the Northeast, we couldn't do it without mentioning this person here, Dorothy Richards, and also talking about what just might have been the American beaver saving grace. At about mid-1800, there was this very inexpensive product coming out of China called Chinese silk. And that's what started to be used primarily for women's fashion in Europe. Hats and gowns and things like that were being made with the silk. So that meant there was less need for hunting beavers. So what happened was this woman, Dorothy Richards, at about 1900 or so, she lived in upstate New York in the Adirondacks regions. She had beavers trapped from Ontario and relocated in New York. And she created a beaver sanctuary. And because of this beaver sanctuary and because of beavers innate want to be able to establish and find other wetlands, they started to become somewhat common by 1915. Imagine that, you know, less than 20 years, this animal was starting to naturally repopulate areas of New York to the point where they were started to being trapped once again by 1923. Some of those beavers made their way across upstate New York and into Massachusetts. And that ended around 1770. It ended the 150 year extirpation of beaver in the state of Massachusetts. And additionally, Mass Audubon played a role in the reintroduction of beavers 
in which our Pleasant Valley Wildlife Sanctuary in Lenox took a couple of beavers from upstate New York and brought them onto their sanctuary. And we think that it was these first beavers that slowly but surely made their way east and repopulated the rest of the state. So I'll pause here for just a moment before we get into all about beavers and kind of their life history. What makes them, you know, how do they make a living? Any questions so far, Robert? So Scott, no questions. And the audience is kind of trained to hold their questions till the end. So Got it. Uh, feel free to keep going. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for that tip. All right, so I won't be able to see who's raising their hand, but have you seen a beaver before? And perhaps many of you have. Perhaps some of you have only seen a beaver as roadkill, sadly, on the side of a road. We know where beavers live. They are a wetland species. And so chances are you're going to need to be in a wetland habitat in order to experience them. However, I do across, come across many people who visit Mass Audubon sanctuaries who still have yet to see a beaver in action with their own very two eyes. And so that may have a lot to do with when they are most active. I like to call them crepuscular. They are most active at dawn and dusk. I'll also add that beaver, they don't read our mammal textbooks. So they don't necessarily know when we say that they're supposed to be active. And so I have seen beaver at certain stretches over my 20 years as being a naturalist active at all times of day and night. You just need to kind of know when the most likely times are based on what they're up to. So let's talk about some of their adaptations. So they are big mammals. A, a beaver can range from between 30 and 80 pounds. Imagine that, an 80 pound beaver, and it's an herbivore. It only eats plant material. They can be up to three and a half feet long, including their tail. They are the largest rodent in North America. However, they're not the largest rodent in the world. Do you know what the largest rodent in the world is? If you happen to know, please put that in the chat. They spend a lot of time underwater. This amazing aquatic mammal can hold its breath for up to 15 minutes at a time before coming up for a breath. They have these wonderful adaptations where they have valves that will close their nose off, they'll close their ears off, and then they also have something over their eyes that we call a nictitating membrane. It's kind of like built-in goggles that help them to be able to see in their aquatic environments. They also have specialized lips in which they can put back behind their incisors. And so that way, if they're carrying food underwater, they can prevent the water from getting into their mouths and down into their windpipes. They have webbed feet on their back toes, of course, and they have that wonderfully flattened tail, which they use as a kickstand and as a rudder. They need a kickstand for when they're chewing down large trees. They have this incredible fur. Their fur is really, really dense. And they have two types of fur. We call the first part the guard fur. And the guard fur is what helps keep the beaver nice and dry or nice and safe from any uh, you know, things in the environment, wind, sand, dirt, things like that. The under fur they have, we call wool. And the wool is what provides the beaver its warmth. A stamp, a posted stamp size of beaver wool has more hairs than most human heads. That's how dense that fur is. Now, in order to make sure that they can continue in their aquatic environments underwater, they need to groom and take care of their fur. And they have another wonderful adaptation for that. They have something on their backside called a castor gland, which links back to something we already mentioned today, right? Their genus name is castor, which means that they can secrete an oil that they use for helping to groom and waterproof 
their outer guard here. If you've ever been to a beaver pond, you might have noticed kind of a musty smell as you made your way around it. And you're, you were smelling that castor-like smell. Beaver are not the only ones that you can find in aquatic environments. And oftentimes, I have people say to me after a walk, whoa, I saw a beaver. It was incredible. And I always say that's fantastic. I don't want to squash their enthusiasm. But chances are pretty good if you're hiking around a wetland by day, you're probably seeing the beaver's smaller wetland cousin. And so this brings me up to my next question for you all. One of these pictures is of a beaver, and one of these pictures is of another wetland mammal. Do you know what the other wetland mammal is? And how do you know the difference between the two? I'll just give you a moment to think on that question. If you guessed muskrat, you are correct. The beaver is on our right, and you can see that this is a much bigger bodied animal. It has big, obvious ears. It has a big nose. And remember, this is an animal that can weigh upwards of 80 pounds. In most of my experiences, when I see beaver, most of their back is submerged under the water, really only giving an appearance of seeing a floating head. As you look at the muskrat on the left, you'll notice that most of the animal's head and back is up out of the water. And you'll also notice that it has a snake-like tail it uses as a paddle as it swims along. And so if it, you see a wetland mammal and it looks like maybe a snake is chasing it, chances are pretty good you're seeing a muskrat. And so what I would ask you to do as someone who's hiking by day in a wetland environment is if you see a wetland mammal, ask yourself, why isn't this a muskrat? It might not be, because they're out there, but chances are pretty good that this is your most likely candidate. Other wetland mammals you could experience here in the Northeast, which are, are less likely, and again, are more active at night, include a couple of weasels. We have a small wetland weasel called the mink that you could encounter. They have long tubular bodies, and when they move, they remind me of slinkies, the way that they kind of amble along. And then the other one is the American or North American river otter. And so that's another mammal that you can sometimes come across in these wetland habitats. One more thing on the muskrat I'll just mentioned, you know, we said that the beaver can be very big, you know, between 30 and 80 pounds. Your average muskrat is going to weigh between two and three pounds. It's a much smaller rodent. So what do beavers eat? They eat a lot of plants. They are strictly herbivores. They eat all kinds of aquatic vegetation, especially during the, the warm weather months. They'll eat things like water lilies, tubers. They will go to some of the uh, shrubs on the edge of a pond or river and snip those down and eat the leaves and twigs and buds. If you're seeing a beaver that's chewing a, a log or a trunk, they're not eating the bark. They want to get below the bark to a layer of tree growth we call the cambium layer. And so I liken it to beavers eating tree branches, kind of like we might eat corn on the cob. They're just, they kind of want the stuff that's out on the outermost edge. Another thing that beavers do that a lot of rodents and lagomorphs, lagomorphs is the family that describes our rabbits. They are what we call cecotropes. Does anyone know what a cecotrope is? Perhaps this is a term that you haven't heard before. What it is, is an animal that will re-ingest their own feces in order to get more of the nutrients out of it. Because their diets are so high in fiber, high in fiber a lot of times that vegetative material, as it passes through their system, there's still a lot of nutrients left even after the first pass through the animal's body. And so they'll re-ingest their scat in order to make sure that they're getting all of the value of the food that they're, they're gobbling down. Mmm, yum. Isn't this a fun topic at about lunchtime? In order to get to some of the branches and so forth, beavers will do something called fell trees or they'll fall trees. 
They do this because they are not arboreal. You'll never find a beaver climbing up a tree. And so if you want to get to all those branches and leaves and buds and things that are up high and you can't climb, how are you going to get them? Well, what they do is they chew down the tree trunk. And usually around wetlands, towards the pond is the down sloped side. And so perhaps you may have wowed or wondered, huh, I wonder how beavers know what direction the tree is going to fall in. And as far as we know, they don't. They need to hope that topography is on their side and that when the tree falls, they're not on the down slope side because there are instances in which the beaver chewing the tree down actually dies because the tree lands on them. But what you'll notice about this tree in the photo is that it has been completely stripped of all its branches. And so beavers are wonderful recyclers. Not only will they eat the branches and buds and leaves, but they'll then take them and they'll use them for other purposes, which we'll get to. Now, what if a beaver can't get to a tree that's on the edge of a pond? Well, they have an answer for that. They will dig these things that we call canals. This trench that you see in this photo is a beaver dug canal. And they do this so that it will fill up with water. And then that way they can swim further into upland areas where they can chew down trees, get to the food that they need. And then they can use the channel to float those branches back to their structures. It's a really cool and clever way for these animals to be able to not have to carry or drag heavy material over land. They can float it. What happens to beavers during the winter, right? Here we have this beautiful beaver pond. I took this picture at our Wachusett Meadow Wildlife Sanctuary out in Princeton. And what you'll notice here is in front of the beaver house, there is a pile of sticks. This is what we call their cache. They will, in fall, October into November, before we get hard free freezes, if we get hard freezes anymore, at this point, with climate change, it may be December into January here in New England. What they're going to do is they're going to stick these branches into the mud in front of their lodge. So that means that when the pond freezes solid, obviously they can't get up to the pond's edge. They're under ice. But what they can do is they can access their cache and nibble off little branches and bring them back up into their home. This is a, about a 10 minute clip of a beaver eating a lily pad leaf that I took. And so there's no volume to it, but we'll just watch this beautiful mammal munching away on its food. Look at the way it holds. They have nice little kind of finger like front paws. Yum. Almost like you're eating your romaine lettuce. Family life. Beavers are very unique. We know them as being monogamous. The, the male and female parents will stay together for as long as they are alive. And they will breed once a year. And they typically have before between four and eight young. And we call their young kits. Here in the Northeast, kits are typically born somewhere between April and June, and in more southern areas within their range in the United States, it would be earlier, and more northern areas in North America, it would be later. Beavers do not rush their young out. So, for example, if you were to find a beaver home, within that beaver home, you're probably going to have mom and dad, you're going to have the kits, right now, here we are in, in July, the babies born within the last month or two, and then you're going to have yearlings, which are the older siblings from last year. They will help to maintain the beaver pond or wetlands around before they then go off and find their own territory. We would call this family unit a beaver colony. Here's one of the structures that they build. This is called a beaver dam. And although this picture doesn't show just how dramatically high it was, I would say this beaver dam in this picture was roughly four feet in height, four feet up. Wow. And so what beavers will do is they'll find areas 
along the substrate of a, a river or a stream, and they will start to find boulders or other things that they can then put sticks and other debris in. And they build up this thing across the flowing water. And then in any of the areas or gaps where water might be seeping through, they will take mud to patch up those areas. Beavers are wetland engineers. They're the only wild mammal that we're aware of here in North America that can manipulate their landscape to suit their own needs other than people, right? And so beavers have so much value. Not only do they build these dams, but on the upriver side, so here is upstream, here is downstream, right? It's dry because it's holding back the water. But somewhere back here, you would also find a structure called a lodge, which I've been referring to as a beaver house. We call beaver homes lodges, and they are a big mound of sticks. I show this picture because it's kind of comical. Uh, a few winters ago, beaver thought it would be a good spot to build their beaver lodge on top of the boardwalk at the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary. And we tried to remove some of the edges of it. And eventually our property staff just put up the white flag because every night they just put more debris on. What they do is they stack up all these branches and so forth. And then what they'll do is they'll excavate their chamber from the inside. And then they'll put mud along the edges. You'll see here that there's mud all along the edges but the very top of the beaver lodge is mud free. This is for respiration. This is so that they can get oxygen and breathe out their, their carbon dioxide. If you know where a beaver lodge is, an active one, on a cold winter's day, you can sometimes see their breath, their vapor coming out of the top of the lodge, kind of like a chimney stack. Don't be fooled. The, the muskrat also builds a lodge in wetlands. But the big difference is muskrats build their lodges mainly of cattails. It's a mound of herbaceous vegetation, whereas the beaver lodge is made of woody, hard vegetation. Here's what the inside of the lodge looks like. There is a, a chamber for in which they would, you know, give birth to young, bring up their food. They have tunnel entrances that we call plunge holes. You can see that there are many of the elements in this nice graphic of the things that we've discussed. Here's the dam on the downstream side. Here's the food storage or cache that we talked about. Here's a canal that they dredged in order to get to more upland plants. The overall mound we call the lodge. Here's the area where fresh air can come in and out. And again, here's the plunge hole. Depending upon the size of the lodge, they may only have one plunge hole, although this graphic shows two. If you do have the fortunate instance in which you're experiencing a beaver in person, you may see some of their defending territorial behavior. This is another short video I took when I had an experience to visit a beaver. And I'll add, that most of the instances in which I have experienced beaver in person in day is around this time of year. In June and early July, there are lots of hungry young kits in the lodge. And I find that mom and dad, and maybe even the yearlings, tend to spend a little bit more time outside of the lodge and patrolling their territory. It could be for you know, making sure that the young are protected. It could be maybe mom and dad are just like, I need a break and need to get out of this house for a little while. But if you see them, this is what they might do for you. You can see all of the space in between the lilies. This is from the beavers munching away. They made their own little channels here on the pond's edge. And this beaver knows I'm standing there on the edge of the pond. And it slapped its tail at me. That's their beaver warning. They do a tail slap. Sometimes it can be startling if you don't know the beaver is there. It almost sounds like someone has thrown a large boulder 
into the water. But they arch up their back, they take that flat tail, they lift it up out of the water and plop, they slap it right down on the water's surface to let onlookers know that they know we're here. And we also think it's a warning to the other beaver within that colony. Another piece of evidence that you might encounter if you're on a beaver pond is this mound of muddy debris on the edge. We call this a scent mound. We think that this is a territorial marker. Not only is this fresh debris that they're putting up on the pond edge, it also has that smell of castor oil. Not only is the castor oil used in helping to groom them, but they will rub their little tushies on these scent mounds in order to make sure they're marking territory to other beavers. Beavers are very territorial. They don't want other members from a different colony coming into their area where they have the food that they need and the wetlands that they're building. A question I often get is, what are some predators of, of coyotes? And the, the honest answer here is here in the Northeast, there are not a lot. And that's probably because that it has played a role in, in why beaver are so numerous here in the Northeast. Some of the mammals or other animals that have been documented across North America and consuming beaver include, but are not limited to, animals like this eastern coyote, a fisher, which is a small weasel, maybe a hawk or an owl, um, brown and black bears, depending upon where you are in the U.S., river otter, lynx or bobcat, eagles, maybe even mountain lion in certain parts of their range. And so, you know, kind of top-notch predatory animals will try to take beaver, but the reality is, is if you're a full-grown 80-pound beaver, the only thing that's probably going to take you is a human, either by trap or by car when you hit one on the road, unfortunately. And that's something I often see in March before the adults are getting ready to give birth to their young. They will send the yearlings out to find their own territories. And so usually around wetlands, I see more dead beaver on roadways in the month of March as young beavers look for their own territories. If you're lucky enough, maybe you'll see a beaver track along the wetland edge in some snow. You can see here that this beaver tracks show the, the webbing in their toes, which is pretty, pretty cool. Beavers are known as keystone species. Keystone species are animals that support entire biological communities. In other words, without a keystone species, the whole ecological chain falls apart. And so here we have a beaver enhanced wetland. And these are just some, a few of the animals that thrive when beavers are around. And I'll start up in the top left-hand corner and go around. We have our beautiful wood duck, a number of freshwater breeding waterfowl breed on beaver ponds. This little amphibian we have here, is called a red spotted newt. Newts are often associated with beaver wetlands. We have a variety of turtles. This is a turtle called the musk turtle, but you'll also find things like painted turtles and snapping turtles in beaver wetlands. We have amphibians like frogs and toads. This is an American toad that breed and hunt and live in beaver wetlands. The great blue heron. Over my 20 years as a naturalist, there has been a close link between the increased population of beaver in Massachusetts and the increased populations of great blue heron. They almost exclusively nest in beaver enhanced ponds. And then there's all the invertebrates, things like dragonflies and damselflies and caddisflies and water beetles. This is a beautiful red dragonfly called the ruby meadowhawk. Here's one of our more classic pond frogs, the pickerel frog. And then, of course, other wetland mammals like this river otter. What's my point about this? My point is, is that beaver are an extremely important animal from an ecological perspective. They should be an animal that people think about how do we make sure that we can live in harmony with these important animals. And so this takes us to our final section which is, I call beaver conservation. 
you know, there are a lot of towns and communities in Massachusetts and beyond who have spent tremendous amount of time and money in trying to get rid of beavers for various reasons. And the reality is, is we've created human infrastructure in desirable beaver habitat. And by trapping out or killing beavers, you're not solving the problem. You're just, you know, putting some scotch tape on the hole in the bow of your ship. So what are some ways in which we can live in harmony with beavers? Well, if you have any ornamental plants, I've heard from people say, I live next to a wetland and I put in, you know, this beautiful maple tree or oak tree and the beaver's chewing on it. You can put in beaver fencing. You simply take, you know, fencing that's two by four mesh, make sure that it's down on the ground, put it around the base of your tree, you know, make sure it's about three or four feet in height, right? Because they can get to about three feet in height. And this will help to protect your tree. The beaver will not chew through this fencing unless the fencing is right up against the bark. You want to make sure that there's a little bit of space between the fence and the tree trunk. This may be a current occurrence in your town right now because of all of the rain we have had. In my experience this summer, the water levels are far higher than any of the beaver dams that I've experienced over the years in the wetlands that I explore. The water is just that high. But if you do have flooded roadways because of beavers, it's because a road was put in an area like this culvert that is the perfect place also for a beaver to build a dam. And so this is a culvert that's working a rainstorm, it would allow for the water to pass through one side of the wetland to the other. But what will beavers do? They might do this. The, the sound and the feel of moving water stimulates beavers to build these structures. And they can and they will flood roadways if your culvert is clogged. So what do we do then, right? I just said trapping and killing beavers is just going to be a very short-term solution. Well, what Mass Audubon has done is we've worked with an organization called Beaver Deceivers International. This uh, gentleman here in the picture is my buddy Skip. He's the owner and operator of Beaver Deceivers International. We were having problems underneath this bridge at the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary. The beavers were damming under the bridge. So we called in Skip. Skip creates these structures. He calls them filters in which you have this fencing that goes under the water. And once it goes under the water in the place of where the beavers are damming, he puts in these long tubes on the upstream side and the downstream side. What these filters do is they catch the flow of the water before the culvert, stopping the feel and sound of water, which of course promotes beavers to dam. And if they do continue to dam, well, these tubes still are able to pull water through in order to make sure that your road or trails or yard or wherever don't get flooded. Here's another picture of Skip working on this filter device. I I've put his web address here in case you're someone who is on a town's conservation commission or something like that, that is thinking, oh my goodness, this is brilliant. If you are on a, a town conscom person, a structure like this could save your municipality hundreds and thousands of dollars a year in beaver maintenance. And it's a win-win because your streets stay dry and the beavers do what they do best. They create habitat for lots of other wetland animals. Once Skip got all of this material in order, this is what it looked like underneath our bridge again. It was a nice flowing stream on the way out to the Ipswich River. We have found that these devices allow us to live in harmony with beavers. We're not the only one. If you live near one of these Mass Audubon sanctuaries, you too can explore and find a beaver flow device. Our broad Meadowbrook in Worcester, Canoe Meadows in Pittsfield, Ipswich River in Topsfield, Laughing Brook in Hamden, Pleasant Valley in Lenox, Stony Brook in Norfolk, Wachusett Meadow in Princeton, and Waseca in Hopkinton. 
These are all the places Mass Audubon is putting our money where our mouth is for beaver conservation. This is an incredibly amazing animal. And not only is it amazing because of its unique and exciting life history, it creates what we call biodiversity. And from an ecological perspective, the more diversity you have in an ecosystem, the healthier that environment is. It's kind of like the canary in the coal mine. If the canary stops singing, you know there's a problem. If we don't have the beavers in our wetlands, we know that there's a problem. They're there to help keep a healthy environment. Well, with all of that, I've taken us through a quick whirlwind of the amazing unknown lives of beavers. Perhaps there are things that you already knew and that's okay. I'm glad you already know about this exciting mammal. And now this is an opportunity for us to ask some questions, perhaps about some of the things that you did not know about beavers before today's presentation. I'll also add that at Mass Audubon Sanctuaries, we offer in-person programs, usually in the fall. And so if you are a Mass Audubon member, I would invite you to check out our online program catalog, and maybe you can be guided to have one of these fun, exciting beaver excursions. So with that, I will turn it back over to Robert and we can do some questions. All right, so folks, let's give Scott a big virtual round of applause for a great presentation. Uh, and Scott, let's take uh, 12 to 15 minutes of questions here. Uh, sure. Mary, yeah, so uh, a couple of comments first. Uh, Mary Ann says that this is a clearly stated, understandable and most interesting. Next time I drive through Boxford and Topsfield, I will slow down and better appreciate these industrious animals. Uh, so Cindy has a question. Does the, uh, un, uh, sorry, does the underwater lens for the beaver's eyes retract when they're above water? It does, yes, yeah. Um, my understanding is this, you know, it's, it's like an additional eyelid and it's not something that's needed when they're above the water's surface. In my experiences in watching beaver, you know, I, I ha can't say that I have seen or observed a nictitating membrane in action. My understanding is that as this animal submerges itself underwater, they will drop this additional kind of eye lens over as built-in goggles. Mm -hmm. uh, you touched on this a little bit, uh, but James asks, do beavers have enemies like birds of prey or snakes? So I can't say that I've come across it, any um, instances in which native snakes play a, a predator to beaver. Um, again, when beavers become fully grown, there are a lot of predators that we have that can take them. Certainly kits, small beavers could be susceptible to prey, including things like red-tailed hawks, if we're thinking birds, a uh, bald eagle would take a baby beaver. Even by evening, you know, we think about mainly diurnal raptors. We have nocturnal raptors. So, you know, there have been instances in which a, a great horned owl can sometimes take a baby beaver as well. Down in the Everglades, there is an introduced snake called the reticulated python, which is non-native. And my understanding is that in, down in that area of the United States, these invasive introduced species are eating all the mammals and lots of other animals as well. And so if we wanted to put a snake name to a potential beaver predator, um, you know, the introduced reticulated python might do that. Uh, Ira asks, how long does it generally take uh, the beaver to make a lodge? It takes some time and it depends on how many individuals are involved. Certainly if there are yearlings with the adults, it can go a little bit more quickly. Beavers will also make den, bank dens or den, uh, bank lodges that they may use while a lodge is under construction, so to speak. And so I can't say that I can give you, you know, specifics, meaning days or weeks or months. But my kind of anecdotal answer to that is it can be pretty quickly, you know, from um, one week to the next week, especially in fall, I'll notice that sometimes beavers will um, go from one lodge and, and make a new lodge. 
in my experience, it's almost like they have a nursery lodge that stays active during the summer months in which they'll raise their young. And then they'll also, you know, have a, a secondary lodge that maybe they'll refurbish in preparation for winter. And so beavers will also sometimes reuse a previous year's lodge. But as far as specific time frames, uh, I don't have numbers and I suspect that it's pretty variable depending upon available resources, meaning how many trees and shrubs and so forth are around and how many beavers within the colony that are working on it. They will build the dam first. Without mm -hmm. the dam, there's really no purpose in building the lodge. And so that segues into our next question, not to be redundant, but Diane asks, are beaver lodges usually next to their dams? And how can you tell the difference between a beaver lodge and a dam? The beaver dams are across the flowing water. And so if you're in a stream or a river and there's a structure that is running from bank to bank that is obviously there to stop the flow of water, you are looking at a beaver dam. Um, they can be, you know, uh, some have been upwards of six feet in height. Some have been up to a hundred feet long. They can get really, really long, right across, um, you know, a riverbank. The lodge is going to be further upstream from the dam in deeper water. That's the whole point of creating the beaver pond. So that way there is sufficient water, uh, sufficient depth. For, for beavers to be able to, you know, build a lodge and be able to get down into their aquatic environments, especially, you know, during the winter months when the surface of the pond freezes. And so in my experience, it's usually when you see the dam, you don't always see the lodge. It, it could be that far further back, depending upon what the landscape looks like. Uh, Beverly asks, what is the typical size of a beaver litter and are the populations of beavers tracked by the Audubon? So to answer the first question, it has to do with the health of the female. Um, you know, a, a female beaver that is not of good health, a female beaver that is not getting the nutrients that she needs may not breed in a season or may only give birth to a couple of, of kits in a season. If you have a, a happy, healthy, well-fed beaver who's in an environment in which there's a lot of food resources, I've read instances in which a female beaver could have upwards of six to eight kits in a breeding season. And so their kind of their health, we think, plays a role in how many young that they'll give birth to. Um, regarding our Audubon sanctuaries, I'm not aware of a formal census that is happening at, on our properties. Uh, there was a volunteer who monitored beavers at Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary when I first started. But the reason for her monitoring was for us to be able to evaluate where were the most strategic spots to put in these water flow devices or these beaver deceivers. It wasn't kind of like a, a, an e-bird count where you're counting individual birds for, you know, census information. So I'm not aware of who's doing that type of research. So we had a couple of questions along this line. Uh, Gail writes, our city disposed of beavers in an inhumane way before the residents knew it was happening. How do we get cities and towns to know about these alternative techniques you describe? Can the Mass Audubon notify them? We had somebody else write, uh, Framingham's first city administration decided to rid itself of some beavers causing some flooding on the south side of the city by drowning them. This was horrible. What humane way could they have used instead? Yes, yeah, that is unfortunately a common way in which some municipalities will um, water trap beavers, meaning that they are, are trapped in an underwater cage and therefore cannot get up to breathe. Um, so there's a couple of things that come to mind. You know, the first thing is we all have uh, our power to vote. And so, you know, I would encourage everyone to be able to get out on those election days, uh, even the town election days, and make sure that your voice is being heard about the people who you want running your towns or cities. Um, the other thing you can do is that towns and cities 
have conservation commissions and they have conservation commission meetings. And so you could become more active in your town politics and you could always introduce some of the information you learned today to your town conservation commission. Or if you have a town conservation commission email, you could forward them, you know, skips link, so to speak, and say, I discovered this, you know, great tool that we could use to help live in harmony with beavers. If you're having difficulty making any headway with your town politicians, Mass Audubon has an advocacy department. And so you could go to the Mass Audubon webpage, you could look up our advocacy department, and there is a general email in which you could submit questions to list, solicit help from our advocacy department. And, and they would definitely get back to you and they would be able to help support you either with providing additional information, maybe writing a letter and helping to support you uh, in your, your efforts to conserve beavers. And so those are some of the things that come to mind. Um, but you know, the, the kind of the squeaky wheel gets oiled, so to speak, right? And so if, if this is something that you're really interested in pursuing, you know, just become, become more involved in your town politics. Uh, we'll take two or three more questions. Uh, Norman asks, how important is the tail to the beaver uh, for swimming? It does, it, it mainly acts as a rudder. And so they don't use it really actively, you know, as like a, a, a whale flipper or something like that, a dorsal fin. Um, not only does it use it as a rudder, I mentioned as it, it's important as a kickstand, you know, to right. give the beaver leverage as it's chewing down trees. The other thing that the tail does that I didn't mention is it provides an area for beaver to store additional fat. You can imagine that during the winter months, in order to consume calories, it's more difficult than during the, the warm herbaceous growing months. And so beavers will eat a lot of food, a lot of plants this time of year, and some of that additional fat will be stored in the tail. But as far as I've, I know, and, and as far as I've experienced, it really isn't, doesn't function as, as a paddle or a flipper or anything like that, nor do they use it to pack down mud on their lodges or their dams. That's kind of a, a, a silly thing that maybe we learned from watching cartoons as children. Um, beavers will use their bodies and their paws to pat down mud on their lodges and their, their dams. And uh, we'll end with this question. It's hard. There's so many questions we're not going to get to, but uh, Beverly wants to know, how is climate change impacting the health of the beaver population? All right. Um, I can't say that I've come across um, direct links linking climate change and beavers. I think what we can do is we can know that we beavers need wetland environments. They they need in order you know wetlands in order to survive, and because of the the demands that people have of um, for water you know through water use through watering lawns washing cars things like that, in typical summers we may have wetlands that go dry. And of course, that's not good for beavers. And so these kind of drastic cycles that we're seeing in which we have really dry spells and then really wet spells, you know, it, it throws off something that we call phenology. These are seasonal instances in which beavers know what to expect within their calendar year. And so I would say it's kind of general, you know, what's impacting, negatively impacting um, wetland creatures will also negatively impact our, our, our beavers as far as climate change is concerned because they need plenty of water and they need clean water as well. All right, I think that's going to do it, Scott. So folks, let's give Scott another big virtual round of applause. He's been very generous with his time. Uh, we didn't get to all questions, but we got to about 10 of them, so we did, we did pretty well. Um, Scott, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap it up? Thanks again for joining me today and hope to see you out at Mass Audubon Sanctuary sometime. And Robert, thanks again for your support of Mass Audubon. We always enjoy tuning in and doing a presentation for the Friends of Tewksbury Library. Yeah, we appreciate it as well, Scott. So thank you so much. And folks, look for that email for me later today with the recording and the feedback survey. So thank you and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.